Hello and welcome back. If you haven't been following along by viewing the previous videos in the series and you're new to InfoPath, I recommend you view the previous videos in the series. So far we haven't spent a lot of time developing the form. The question has to be, how can form fillers make use of the form? You may recall in an earlier video I mentioned InfoPath has two parts of the application. One part is used to develop a form, the second part of the application is used to fill in the form and this is called InfoPath Filler. The end user requires InfoPath Filler to be installed on their device and let's be honest, most users won't be keen to initiate the application even if they were to receive an email with the form attached or directed to a network share holding the form. If they were to fill in the form using InfoPath Filler then went on to submit the form to SharePoint Forms, administrator might be left with the odious task of processing the data. Having said that, in some cases, email is a very valid option to be considered. Besides, the form I've been developing is a web form and not a form filler of option. This means form fillers will use their browsers to complete and submit the form. The alternative to InfoPath Filler is to publish the form to SharePoint. Doing so makes it easy for the user. They simply visit the organization's intranet web page to fill in and submit the form. Program rules can be configured to automate the back office data processing. For example, an employee submits a holiday request. Provided the head of department agrees, the form can move to the human resource records. If the employee is flagged as entitled to leave, the form can move to the payroll department. This process can be initiated by the employee submission and the department head clicking OK. Let's take a look at the slide I prepared to illustrate the publishing steps. My first step is to publish the InfoPath template to SharePoint and create the associated library. The second step is to configure the mechanism for the form fillers to submit the completed form. The third step is to republish the form. This stage updates the template stored in SharePoint. Doing so instructs SharePoint as to what to do with the form when the form filler submits the completed form. Let's take a look at SharePoint form for restaurant audit. I visit my team site and I can view the form by clicking the menu on the right hand side. Then I simply click the plus button. As an administrator I can see submitted forms. The SharePoint view can be configured to suit the needs of the user. Let's take a look at the file names of the submitted forms. Naming will prove to be very important to you. If you use the same form name, the previous form will be overwritten. Another important factor might be your need to locate a specific form. This may prove troublesome if you have hundreds of forms to sort through. At present I have two forms, so this isn't a problem. However, by reading the form's name and SharePoint columns, I can easily identify who submitted the form and when. When the form page loads, I can view the form. I can select a restaurant name from the drop-down option. I can choose the sound system option. I can click the insert housekeeping and move down to the beverage charges and enter beverages purchased. For beverage, I enter gin and tonic. For quantity, I enter two and for unit price 995. If I move back up to the top of the form and then enter a name and email address I can submit the form. I cannot submit a form unless the compulsory fields are completed. So let me show you how to publish an InfoPath form to SharePoint site. The first step is to utilize InfoPath to publish the form to SharePoint then use InfoPath to configure the form submit functionality. Finally, I need to republish the form to SharePoint. Implementing this method enables InfoPath to collaborate with SharePoint in the creation of a SharePoint library. So let's refer back to the form I've been developing. First, I'll check to see the form has to be developed for browser use by clicking save as or alternatively looking in my home tab in the controls section. Under containers I can see only six choices. 
That confirms to me this form has been developed for a browser. If I had more than six choices, I would know the form has been developed for InfoPAR form filler. This means users will require InfoPAR filler to fill in the form. Before publishing, let's move on and check the form for errors. I click File, and under Info section, I see Design Checker. I click this. Immediately, I revert back to the form, and I should see a right hand pane opens. A form check has run and any errors will be reported in this pane. I can see no errors have been flagged for my attention so my form is good shape to publish. I click file again and this time I click publish in the left hand side menu section. Under publish I click publish to SharePoint library. The wizard runs and I'm asked to provide my SharePoint site location. In other words, web URL address. I don't need to provide a library address. I haven't yet created it. I switch to my SharePoint site and copy my URL from the browser address bar. I copy up to the .com. I switch back to InfoPath Wizard and place my cursor in the box and paste the SharePoint address into the box. Then I click Next. Don't be offended if SharePoint asks you to provide your credentials. Your data is important to you, consequently all that can be reasonably done to protect your data should be fully implemented. Whether you see such notifications will depend upon how your SharePoint connection has been configured. Next, you'll see a tick box with a tick. I leave this tick box because I want form fillers to use a browser to fill in the form. Doing so ensures when a user visits the library and clicks to initiate the form opening, the form will always use the browser, even if the user has the InfoPath filler installed on their workstation. I click Next, and I leave the default option to create a new library. If I wanted to update my form template, I select the Update the form template from the existing library list by choosing the option and scrolling through the library list to find the library template I want to update. I don't need to do this, so I'm happy to proceed, so I click Next. Then I'm asked to name the library and provide a description. I urge you to spend some time formulating a descriptive name and description. I can't tell you the number of times I've regretted not doing so. I arrogantly thought I would remember the form from the name alone. Of course I couldn't after a week or so. I should emphasize here the name creates the URL address. This means you should create a name using camel case casing and no spaces. In descriptions, I'll enter something like, this form is for use of restaurant assessors. The purpose of the form is to evaluate a restaurant's product service standards. I'm happy with my short name and description, so I click next to move the wizard on. I'm asked to select columns that will appear in SharePoint site page. Let's switch back to my SharePoint site. You can see I have surname, date, and restaurant, and first name. Switching back to InfoPath, I'm going to click the Add button, and add first name, and last name. I'll cover columns in greater detail later on in this video. I click to finish, I click to open library. When the form library opens, I can click file new document. The form opens, but I should point out to you, at present there is no way for a form filler to see Let's begin by referring to my slides seen earlier on in this video. As you have probably Assumed correctly, the first step has been completed, so my next step is to configure SharePoint Submit form. Let me switch back to InfoPath. Looking up at InfoPath menu tabs, I select Data. Looking at the Submit form section, I see four icons. I'm going to choose to SharePoint Library. I could have selected File, Info, Run, Design Checker, then pick File again. 
but this time from the list I choose Publish, then select Publish a form to SharePoint Library. Either way I initiate the Data Connection Wizard. I need to select the library. I can switch back to my SharePoint site to repeat what I did earlier, uh, that is to copy the SharePoint URL up to the .com. I paste this into the Document Library Wizard. I can now use the drop down to locate the alphabetical ordered library list. This emphasizes why naming is important. A good name will trigger your memory to select the library you require. You should note the library address should end with a forward slash. Next, I require a file name for submitted forms. I cannot apply a generic file name. Windows won't allow this and if I did by placing a tick in the allow over written box I would always have just a single form in the library. Historical form submissions would be lost. To help the administrator to locate form submissions I must apply a unique descriptive form names formula. I can do this by clicking the FX button. The insert formula window opens. I click the insert function and select concatenate then click OK. The formula enables me to assign a unique URL address. It's worth noting URLs are capped at 255 characters. You're probably thinking this is more than enough. I can assure you unless you keep your name short it's only too easy to reach 255 character cap. Why? The URL will have the same server name, site name, library name and if you choose to use a long form name you'll probably find you've easily reached a 255 character cap. I begin by double clicking the first double click to insert field. I select surname then for the second double click to insert field I choose the date. For the third restaurant name I could insert spaces between the fields by inserting double quotes then an underscore and close quotes followed by a comma. You could choose to type generic text before double click to insert field for example I could type restaurant assessor form and place underscores between the words. Not doing so will result in a percentage symbol and the number 20 appearing between the word spaces. I will then follow the generic text with a double click to insert fields. The key takeaway here is for you 255 character cap. So keep your form name descriptive but short. My next step is to verify the formula. It's OK so I can click OK to close the windows then click the next button. The data name for the connection should be left as is so I click finish. Now that the submit form component has been configured I need to republish the form. Let's begin by referring to my slide seen earlier on in this video. As you can see we've reached the final step. I'm going to return to my info bar form and click file. I click publish option on the left hand side. I could choose quick publish. Doing so would allow form filler to submit the form but this will limit my ability to change SharePoint columns. On reflection I may want to change how I configured my InfoPath columns to appear in SharePoint. To enable my choices I choose Publish to SharePoint Server Library. Notice the library address is pre-populated. The wizard knows where I want to publish the form so I'm happy to click Next. If I had developed this form using a development server and wanted to move to a production server then I would make changes here. I can accept the default setting form in a browser by clicking next. The next window is different because this time I'm updating a library. I must select the library I set up earlier. I click next and the column options appear. This is where I can add columns or remove. Adding additional columns here will result in additional columns appearing 
in the SharePoint library. However, I can create different views to suit the needs of the end user. Alternatively, I can hide some of the columns in SharePoint. I'm going to add today's date and the beverage grand total. Then I click Next, then click Publish. The reason I run the Publish to SharePoint Server wizard was to amend columns I had previously set. I wanted to illustrate how to do so. Next, I check to see the tick in the box for the Open This Form Library. There is a tick, so I can click Close. Notice the additional columns. I click File and select New Document. Notice the Submit button. Users can save the form and complete the form at a later date or just submit. They can choose the views that have been configured for them. Notice as I hover over the fields, a message appears cannot be blank. If I type an email address and forget to type the .com, the message tells me to correct this. I can change the date. Note the date is set to the date the form was started. I can select the name of the restaurant. You see additional fields are populated with data held concerning the restaurant. I can replace live music with sound system. I place a tick in the box to add notes. Notice when I place my cursor in the text box the menu changes to offer me rich text tools. In the general section I look at the question were menus, cards and posters descriptive, clean and neat. Looking at the drop down I select no. Immediately a note section appears allowing the assessor to make notes. I can insert and I can remove housekeeping questions. Moving down to beverage charges I can type gin and tonic. For quantity I enter 2. For unit price 995. Note automated calculation fields cannot be altered. I click to add assessor's guest beverage charge and enter Volca and Orange. For quantity, I enter 1 and for £9 for the unit price. I add another beverage, Bloody Mary, for quantity 1 and for unit price 12 75 I can insert a drink between the first and the second drink. I'll add mineral water for quantity 1 and unit price 4 85 I can remove Bloody Mary. Notice the grand total is recalculated. Finally, if fields are not filled in, the form cannot be submitted. We have come to the end of the series. My objective for these videos is to encourage you to explore InfoPath. By doing so, you will discover a great deal more. I wish you well. Thank you for viewing.